Okay, a uh, quick point, and nobody ever seems to bring this up. My favorite photographer all the time, and he was a technical photographer, he was a commercial photographer mostly, but he did a lot of uh, sports, he did everything, old Dean Collins. Someone has uh, illegally uploaded, he died of cancer. Um, I remember seeing him in photography school a few times. Uh, he was uh, Dean Collins, and uh, I learned uh, a lot from him, stuff that uh, my teachers uh, never taught me there because some of them were idiots, not all, and there's some really good teachers there. Some of them are crackpots, um, but, you know, any college is that way, right? Um, being able to see in uh, your scene. The one advantage that I can think of that a colorblind person has is that you can tell them 18% gray and uh, everything they see is gray, <laughs> gray, black and white and gray. Um, is being able to see uh, your midtones, your 18% gray, or what is your midtone, your, your specular, your diffuse, your midtones, and uh, your shadows. You're able to identify the dynamic range of your scene. What is really important, and something I do with every Nikon camera that I have, including my Fujis, uh, is that I reassign a front function button to spot metering. And I use it all the time, 80% uh, of the time working aperture priority and spot metering. Um, obviously there are times where you cannot sit there and make a, uh, a logical choice no matter how fast you are. When it's sports, action, and wildlife, on, uh, you still can. Uh, as far as what your midtones are, as far as something coming faster around the track, or you know, you just don't have the time to judge. You make an intelligent uh, choice, and then you're able to uh, correct it in Lightroom if you have to at all. But I mean, make a wise, intelligent choice to begin with. Being able to see a scene for what it is, and so far as the dynamic range is too excessive, what is it that you're going to meter off of? Because your camera. Here's a shot of the dynamic range. This is a test shot with an Nikon D500. It doesn't matter what camera it is. Okay, I'm not talking about the Nikon D500. Obviously, the dynamic range. What is the dynamic range of your camera? You know, is it broad spectrum? Is it narrow spectrum? You know, uh, do you have, uh, you know, how many stops of latitude do you have between your specular and your shadow and your dynamic range of your camera? And uh, ultimately, of course, you don't want to have to sit there and manually expose certain parts of your shot and light. That ta e time is money, and that eats up a lot of time. If you know anything about Lightroom, you can actually, you know, take some of these shadows and you can expose for your highlights. And then, if this is uh, too far out and you have an ISO invariant sensor, you can raise the exposure. You can highlight it in Lightroom and uh, raise uh, up uh, your shadows uh, in post and do selective. Uh, editing as far as the exposure. You don't have to bring up the exposure on the entire shot. You can bring up selectively the exposure, but metering the shot, being able to see what is the midtones, immediately able to identify where your 18% grays, and being able to immediately identify, regardless of what the color is, where your 18% or where your midtones are. Where's your 18% on this? Where am I going to meter? There are more ways than one, obviously, to skin a cat. Some people develop certain ways and are just as valid as others. Some are more reliable than others, given the percentage of situations and exposures of what you're going to be taking shots of. But people fall into comfort levels as far as what there is. Some people are actually taught to meter for the highlights and open up to, depending on uh, the dynamic range of your camera, to meter for the highlights and open up to two and a half stops. Therefore, you won't, uh, you won't be clipping, you won't be, uh, you know, uh, you won't be overexposed on your shot. And then you're able to uh, correctly edit the shot without any worries. Some people are actually taught to expose. The zone system, Ansel Adams zone system, is as applicable now as it ever was. Everybody should learn how to use the zone system. I made several videos on the zone system like a year ago. Being able to identify the mid-tones, regardless of color, of your shot. Okay, Because your camera doesn't see colors. Your sensor sees colors. When your camera is metering... The shot, if you're not use, if you're using a DSLR instead of a mirrorless, even mirrorlesses don't uh, measure the color. Being able to uh, check what the midtone is in your shot, because your camera only sees exposure values, not color, and you need to be able to understand what it is you're looking at, what your camera sees. Your camera wants to turn everything into sludge. Okay, you stick it on matrix metering, whether you're in aperture priority or shutter priority, or a P mode, puss mode. Uh, <laughs> Your camera wants to turn everything into mush. It will take this and say, okay, I got 40% to highlights here with the six stop variance over my shadows. It will take the average between this 
and uh, these shadows and it will mush it together and it will come up with the mean average so that you aren't clipped here if you've got a decent camera. If however the dynamic range is too excessive and you have some serious small specular highlights right here this is just uh, uh, seven or eight stops between here and here but this comprises say 10 or 15 percent of the scene and your matrix metering doesn't matter how expensive your camera is it's not going to expose it properly well it expose everything over here properly but everything over here will be blown you can't recover you can to a certain degree but if it's blown it's blown your camera is not smart enough no matter how good you can you have to be able to identify these things so i've got too much dynamic range in my scene relative to what my camera can capture and this is one that approaches that to be sure this was not edited this was straight out of camera just to show a test shot from the nikon d500 that I know that I am going to want to meter off my highlights, open up two, two and a half stops, depending on the camera, depending on the dynamic range of your camera, that I know I can take care of everything as quickly, as expediently, with as little time and effort as possible in post, in Lightroom, at the computer, at home, in the evening when you brought your camera back home. So what is it are you going to meter for? Be, you know, the quickest with the best, I said this over and over again, and people will come back and they say, you know, it's, you're exactly right, I didn't believe you, and then I tried it. Go out and fail. Either stick your camera in spot metering, or start using, apply, a, uh, reassign one of your front, front function buttons to spot metering, and start spot metering your scenes and understanding what it is you're exposing for. You'll be able to see immediately, you'll have to train your brain and your eyeballs to identify the dynamic range within a scene to say, well, this is going to be blown out. If I use matrix metering here, my camera, well, it's an awesome camera, it's going to screw it up, it's going to jack it up, okay? It, it just is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spot meter, I've identified, you, you can work it many different ways. You can identify the midtones and open it up uh, two, two and a half stops, three stops, or you can expose for the highlights. Um, excuse me, I'll expose for the highlights and open up two, two and a half, three stops, or expose for your midtones and work off of that exposure. See, so, you know, it doesn't matter if you work from the front to the back. You no matter if you work from the, you don't want to work from the shadows, of course. You want to work from the midtones or from the highlights. So if you work from the highlights and expose up two, two and a half, three stops, that's fine. If you want to expose from the midtones and work off of that exposure and determine within your brain quickly that my camera is going to get it wrong and open up a stop you know, either way, a stop one way or a stop another way. It depends on the composition and what you want the shot to be. You know, I've often bitched about endlessly that, you know, why does every shot have to be perfectly illuminated? Every, all this HDR photography, I mean, some of them, uh, many of the most beautiful shots to me are shots where, you know, 80% of the frame of the composition is just black. Okay, the only thing that's exposed for, say this is a person's face, everything over here is just black. The only thing that's uh, properly exposed would be this, and that would be a person's face. Okay, that's the only highlight there is. That's all I'm exposing for. Absence speaks as much as presence. You know, all of this HDR BS, while it has its place, it gets old. You know, photography is not about properly exposing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna take an HDR shot of this. I'm gonna combine five pictures and post, and everything is gonna be 18% gray. As far as you know, wow, that's great. You know, everything has the proper color saturation, but it's a fake shot. It looks unreal for a reason because we don't see that crap in everyday life. It doesn't exist for a reason. Our camera is a time machine, and you can either use that to a benefit or you can use that to a detriment. And using it to a detriment is all this damn, and you know, some beautiful HDR photography, beautiful. But there's too much damn HDR photography. I mean, damn, really? Really? I mean, do you want everything within the scene to be perfectly, evenly exposed? Do you really? How about going the other way? I mean, the most beautiful shots I've seen. This is the same reason. Okay, well, this sounds crude. It's a perfect analogy, and stupid men will understand this. You know, this is why you could take the same identical woman and you could take a gross, disgusting, you know, perfectly exposed, perfectly illuminated hustler shot where everything's like, ah, it's too much, ah, I see everything. I don't want to see all that. You know, how about 80% of the shot is totally black? And all I can see is like, uh, you know, the light skimming across the stomach where you can just barely see the belly button, you can barely see part. You know, that's a beautiful shot. One shot is like, oh my god, gross. You would never hang that up on your wall unless you were a pervert, right? The other shot is like, damn, that's art. Damn, that's beautiful. Damn, that's even a picture that if I took it, I would even show my mother. It's like, that's a beautiful, she would go like, that's a tasteful shot. That's a beautiful shot. Like, well, 80% of the, the composition is just flat out. Like, what do you want to expose for? This is why spot metering is so important. 
I mean, when you turn your brain off and you turn your camera on, you're supposed, when you turn your camera on, you're not supposed to be turning your brain off. Okay, remember that. When you turn your camera on, that doesn't mean you turn your brain off. Click. You know? It doesn't work that way. A lot of people think it does work. Well, I got an advanced camera. I can properly meter anything. Well, number one, that's not true. And number two, if it was true, would you want it to be true? And is that really art? Does that mean you're not putting anything of your soul, your life, anything into the picture? I'll let my camera, but I'm going to take some, I'm going to, I'm going to sit this on a tripod and I'm going to take five shots and bracket it two slots. I'm going to take a perfect HDR picture. I'm going to combine them all in Lightroom and everything's going to be BAM! Perfect color saturation. Wow, what a boring shot. It'll look fake. It'll be unreal. I mean, there's no truth in photography. Everything is a lie. You could take a beautiful woman and a crappy photographer and make the beautiful woman look like a dog. Uh, people, uh, expert photographers, are paid to go out and take corporate shots of like a hotel or something for like a sales brochure. They're like, man, this hotel's a dump. You know, there's a wino pissing in the... And if a good photographer knows what he's doing, he'll make that hotel look like the Trump Palace because he will select things out. He will selectively shade and meter the shot so and you'll expose it to either early morning late evening where the sun is hitting it right and you can make a dumpy hotel look like that this is what happens you ever been like on Expedia and you go to a hotel like, man those are some awesome pictures and you get there and then you realize that the asshole that took a picture of the inside of the hotel room was using a really wide angle lens so <laughs> what you thought was a spacious room was really a tiny little dump not big enough to whip a cat in yeah that's what defines good photography you can make a dump look like the Trump Palace. You can make a, a nasty uh, uh, thing that you see with your eyes. It's not about taking a picture that you see with your eyes. It's about making something awesome that your eyes can't see. So when you turn your camera on, that is also when you're supposed to be turning your brain on, not your brain off, okay? Anyway, just start spot metering and going out and failing and start seeing and identifying the specular, the diffuse and uh, the shadows, okay? Your highlights, your midtones, and your shadows. And know what the hell it is you're metering for, okay?